26 to 39, you would see how in his in his spiritual Jesus, we're told, miraculous, miraculously frees him from his spiritual bondage. And if you look specifically at verse 38 here in this chapter, you will read how this man begs Jesus for the opportunity to join him on his, his preaching tour ministry. To which Jesus responds, no. He says, go out. He says, you go out. You don't need to join me. You go out and tell others what God has done for you. And for me, that just really reinforces the very basic truth, brothers and sisters, that witnessing for Jesus isn't that complicated. Just tell your story, right? I was once enslaved, but now I'm free. I was once broken, but now I'm healed. I was once overwhelmed with depression, right? But now I live my life with hope. I was once angry all the time, but now I'm angry far less. Right? Jesus is changing me. Jesus is healing me. Tell your story. In fact, turn to your neighbor and say, you have a story to tell. Brothers and sisters, we all have a story to tell. And so do you want to have a life legacy that impacts people? Then tell your story, right? Share your story. I think one of the things that we see, the truths that we see here in this simple Bible verse here in verse 1, is that once you become a Christian, don't spend all your time inside the building. Go out, right? And share the good news of how God is flourishing your life. You know, the Bible writer describes here in verses 1 and 2 how Jesus invites 12 men along with a group of women to join him on his preaching, teaching tour. And in so doing, Jesus really showcases his second legacy team strategy, which is to invite in. Invite in. You know, two weeks ago, we, dis- we discussed how Jesus, when he was calling his disciples, how he invited in Simon the Zealot and Matthew the tax collector to be a part of his legacy list, to be really members of Jesus's, what we would call his exclusive 12 disciple posse. And in, those, <clears throat> and in that day and age, as we talked about, and as you likely know, the Zealots were, were really hated anything to do with Rome, right? They were considered enemies of the state. And so the fact that Matthew, as a tax collector, worked for the Roman government, to me, illustrates how the gospel has the power to bring people together. Are you with me? Even those people who you or I hate, if you have anybody like that in your life, the Bible illustrates How God can bring together. Even people who are enemies. Who don't see things the same way. Jesus can bring together. Just like he did with Matthew and Simon. You know in Jesus' day. as Again as many of you know. Women were relegated to a second tier status. Jewish rabbis refused to allow. Really the Jewish rabbis refused to mentor women. For starters. If women came to the synagogue, they, they required them to be silent. They were not allowed to open their mouths in, in, when they were gathered in worship. And yet we read here how Jesus not only welcomes women into his fellowship and invites them to participate, but really we see how he invites them to share in the responsibilities of his preaching, teaching, miracle-doing ministry. If you look at verse 2 again, and and verse 3, we're given the names of a few of these women. Mary Magdalene is is mentioned first. Mary, we know, is from the town of Magdala. Magdalene is simply a descriptor. And so Magdala, uh, in the the Greek language, uh, says the tower. And so my assumption is that Mary Magdalene, or Mary from the town of Magdala, uh, lived, came from a town that had a tower structure uh, in it. Uh, Costa Mesa, for example, to to kind of make a parallel, Costa Mesa is is known, we're a city of what? We're a city of the arts. Have you ever heard that? We're the city of the arts. Why is that? 
because of the Sagerstrom, right, performing uh, arts theater. Uh, by the way, church, it's pronounced Sagerstrom, not Sagerstrom. And, and you say, Mike, Mike White's that a big deal. It's a big deal if you're asking the Sagerstrom Foundation for money. Right? You kind of want to know how to say someone's name. It's Mike Decker, not Mike Deeker. It's Bauermeister, not Beenermeister, right? <clears throat> it, it's Eccles, not Eagles. It's Sagerstrom, not Segerstrom. So say with me, Sagerstrom. Sagerstrom. Names matter. Well, Mary Magdalene, a woman from Magdala, we're told, basically it, it, it infers that she has a dark and evil past. We're told that Jesus rescues and delivers her from a very distressing existence by casting out seven demons, seven evil spirits that are within her. And then not only does he deliver her from this shady lifestyle, if you will, or past, but he then invites her, right, to join him on his preaching tour. Which showcases the truth, and this is good news, that every person is eligible to be a part of Jesus' team. Somebody say amen to that. That's good news. That means you and I can be a part of Jesus' team. In fact, I want us to pause right now. Let's just say a prayer of thanks, okay? So we'll call it our Thanksgiving prayer. So put your palms out again in front of you. <clears throat> Maybe for this exercise, not that there's anything spiritual in it, but I invite you to just close your eyes. So it's just you and the Lord. And I want you in this prayer, okay, so take a deep breath and just inhale and just hold it. Just to kind of center down and exhale. Now in this prayer, just say this silently to yourself. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus welcomes me. Jesus invites me. Jesus forgives me. Jesus restores me. Jesus values me. Jesus is with me. Amen. Friends, Jesus welcomes us and invites us to join him on his legacy team. And we see that here with Mary Magdalene. In addition to Mary, Joanna, we're told, the wife of Chusa, King Herod's steward, is also mentioned. Now, the Bible doesn't give us any kind of color for the precise nature of Chusa's responsibility with King Herod's court. But as the business manager, we're told, or at least my translation says he's the business manager, I'm making the assumption that Chusa, Joanna's husband, likely had responsibility and managed King Herod's financial interests and probably, probably his property uh, uh, interest, you know, his management. And some of you who have worked, you know, Steve, for example, you know what it's like to work for people who have, you know, fiefdoms. And some of you manage people, stewards. Lisa Banning's in the, in the coaching element, right, where she's helping people manage. So you can identify with, with Chusa as the business, business manager. But we can assume, even though the Bible doesn't give us anything about Chusa, uh, any color about him, we can assume that he's a very trusted and important official in 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 the Roman government, so to speak. And therefore, don't miss this, Joanna, as the wife of Chusa, would have been considered to be a lady of the court. And a lady of the court would have been politically connected. Incidentally, Joanna is also mentioned in Luke 24, verse 10, as being present at Jesus' empty tomb following Jesus' crucifixion, burial, and, and resu resurrection. And, and really, what this illustrates is Joanna, the wife of Chusa, who's a business manager for King Herod, was with Jesus throughout his entire Ministry. She was likely one of the first Christians who, uh, uh, of the early church. And we see her here referenced in, in this Bible story. 
And I'm proposing that by mentioning the names of these women, Luke, the Bible writer, is emphasizing how part of Jesus' ministry strategy involved inviting others to join him on his legacy team. You know, that day and age, it would have been very unusual to find Mary Magdalene and Joanna to be in the same company in secular circles, which again, just simply reinforces the truth, how Jesus brings people together. Are you with me? So church, don't miss this. Healthy, healthy legacy teams are comprised of individuals with diverse personalities and interesting Backgrounds. In fact, write this down somewhere in, in your notes if you have your app. It says, God welcomes the outlier. God welcomes the outlier. He welcomes you. He welcomes me. And so personalize this. Think about this. Who in your social circles have you dismissed may be considered as being uninterested in, in Jesus or uninterested in church stuff or religion. We're not, we don't, it's not about religion, it's about what? Relationship. So when you think about the outliers in, in your world, who have you kind of dismissed thinking that they would not be interested in, in, in Jesus? I think this Bible story really reinforces the truth. That God welcomes the outlier. And just because someone has color in their life, just because someone comes from a, a, maybe an area of, 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 of you know, a circles of influence that we are not a part of, whether it be Joanna or Mary, doesn't mean that God doesn't welcome him. This Bible story, by highlighting Jesus' activity, encourages us to be inviters. So I just want to challenge you to prayerfully consider who can you invite to join you at your weekly Bible study that some of you are a part of? Who can you invite to, to join you some weekend here on campus for a Palm Harvest worship gathering? Because a healthy, strong, and legacy team is comprised of people from all walks of life. You know, you are different. That's a good thing to say to your neighbor. You're different, right? But God loves you. And God loves me. And he invites us to be a part of his team. Okay? So that was legacy strategy number two. So finally, let's, let's wrap up. The third legacy team strategy that we see here in these verses is what I'm calling share the load together. Share the load together. Go out, invite in. And share the load together. King Solomon wrote, as recorded in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. You know these verses. as two people are better than one and can accomplish twice as much as one. They get a better return for their labor. If one falls down, the other can reach out and help. But people who are alone, the Bible says, when they fall are in real trouble. Solomon rose, goes on. He says, a person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. You know, as we've discussed this truth previously, how in that day and age, in that culture, women would not have been allowed to speak, let alone preach, at least not prior to the arrival of Jesus. And so one of the ways that we see that women participating, particularly here in this Bible story, which I'm assuming was probably commonplace in that day and age, was to participate financially, by supporting financially the, what Luke talks about here in, in verse 3. It says, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Susanna, and many others were told, financially undergirded and supported Jesus and his disciples, just as many of you here are, are doing as well. You know, you've likely heard me tell the story of the shoemaker who, who always wanted to be the past, a pastor, right? But because of situation, family situations, he was never able to allow to go to school or to go to seminary. And, you know, if full disclosure, he really wasn't that good of a, an oratory speaker. And so when his buddy graduated from seminary, he went up to him and he said, Hey, John, you know, I have a, a favor to ask. And he said, Shoot, you know, we're buddies. He said, I know you just got a, a, a gig here. <laughs> you know, he called it a gig. A, a gig here in a local church in 
in town where you're going to be the, their new pastor. He said, I would love to have the honor of making your leather shoes for you. Your handcrafted leather shoes for you so that when you get up into the pulpit, when you get up on stage to preach the word of God, something that I've always wanted to do, but I just never really had the gift set to do it. He says, I'll feel like I'm stepping up on stage with you. So that when you preach about Jesus from the Bible and as you use your oratory gifts, you'll be comfortable doing it, right? Because you'll be wearing my handcrafted leather shoes just for you. We are, we are a team. A legacy team shares the load. A legacy team serves God together. You know, hopefully today after our service at 11 o'clock, a lot of you are planning on coming over to our house, Robin and our house, for, uh, my house for a, a potluck. If you don't have anything to bring, that's okay. Just come anyway, so there'll be plenty of food. But the big thing that we're going to do at, besides eating some really great boysenberry muffins that Rob's bringing, homemade, uh, is we're going to hear from Joseph and Dorian. About a month ago, we, we collected and, you know, a special offering just over the course of the month. And, and people have been giving, by the way, from the community as well. People who are tuning in online, so thank you. And the, and the goal was for us as a team, we couldn't all go to Mexico, right, for this, this camp. But Joseph and Dorian had the opportunity to. And so we, because we, like Joanna and, and, and Mary and Susanna and many others, we threw a little bit of money into the plate and we sponsored them. And so at this brunch, we're just going to hear from them about their camp, camp experience. And for me, it just really reinforces what we're going to experience again at this brunch is how a legacy team, a healthy legacy team, shares the load. We all do just a little bit. You know, this past week, I escaped to the desert, out to Indio for 48 hours to invest in three pastors, all of whom lead a church here in Costa Mesa. You know, for 25 years, every year I go to the once or twice, I go out to Palm Springs or Indio, and I'll grab a couple of pastors to join me. And it just, we just have this kind of what I would call really light uh, mentoring, where we gather together and we talk about what's going on in our life, and we maybe learn from each other. And there's a scripture verse that says, iron sharpens iron, and we just have a really good, good time. And, 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 and in part, as, as, as a church, here's one of the kingdom responsibilities. You're, you're a part of that, because whether you... No, intentionally or not, you're giving me the opportunity to do that. But here's a little tidbit I learned this past weekend that I, I've sort of trying not to admit. I am now the longest tenured pastor in Costa Mesa. 34 years I've served in Costa Mesa. Everybody, all my, other, all my peers have either retired or they've left the area. And so now you get the old guy. Right? How are you feeling about that? But I feel like one of our kingdom responsibilities that God is saying to us as a church now is how are you going to how are you going to steward that as a team? How are you going to pour yourself into these next generation of, of leaders? Are you with me? And many of you are are doing that already. You know, Coach Vargas. I was driving on, uh, past the high school this week, and and on on my on my way to the office, and I saw you out by the football field, standing out uh, with a couple of two or there were three young men with you. I don't know if you were reprimanding them, whatever. But there was some coaching going on, right? Doctor Bauermeister's at Back Bay High School. He's doing coaching with with, with faculty, right, and and and, and students. You know, Joe Banning, who's a part of our our, our community. Uh, kind of outreach team. Joe is involved with the Love Coast Mesa and he's teaching and he's mentoring and he's coaching these kids and young adults and older adults how to serve and to roll up their sleeves. You know, Lisa I mentioned already is a financial coach. We are a church of coaches, yes. And part of our responsibility as coaches is to come together and to throw in whatever little bit we can to help each other impact people's lives. Many of you are giving your money, both here and online. Thank you for your support. You know, as a church, did you know that we support various entities in the community? There's a, pat, there's a, a, a young man, and many of you have met him, a David Barrera, who's a missionary. He's a part of the Crew Campus Crusade a ministry that we basically we give money every month to help David share the love of Jesus with students at Estancia High School. Did you know that you're doing that when you give your money? 
As a church, we give money every month to help support a youth ministry over on the west side of church, town. There's three different churches, that, and Paul Marvis is part of that. We are helping invest in the, the youth of our city. Did you know that you're doing that? And so, brothers and sisters, when we give our money, it's not just, I guess, what, for me, the takeaway is Paul Marvis Church is far more than just what takes place on this campus. Are you with me? Between 9 and 10 a.m. We're a team. We're a legacy team. And together, as we share the load, as a legacy team, we are practicing what Jesus himself modeled. You know, we are on the, on the verge of May, right? Tomorrow, May 1st. In a couple months, we're going to be having a, our barbecue, our annual 4th of July barbecue with our cops. Put it on your calendar. It's a barbecue we've been doing for like 25, 26 years, every year. Just this past week, I was in conversation with our fire chief and our police chief. Brothers and sisters, we are a team. We are impacting people's lives. Sometimes it's hard to see. But I want you to just, here. in fact, turn to your neighbor right now and just say, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm on your team. You're on my team. I'm with you. And so here's two legacy questions that I invite you to ponder this week. They're in your app, but let me read them for you. Question number one. To whom is Jesus asking you to talk to? So when we think about this going out, inviting in, sharing the load together, who in your circles... Is God inviting you to talk to? Who are the Mary Magdalene's in your world? Who are the Joanna, the wife of Chusa, in your world? Who are the people who have color in their lives in your world? Could God be asking you to talk to them? And then similarly, second question is, with whom is Jesus inviting you to team up with? You know, one of the things we, I talk about a lot is the 5.3 principle. And let me just refresh your memory if you don't know what that is. But the average person, before they become a follower of Jesus, will have an authentic friendship with 5.3 other Christians. Right? And so my job is to, to, when I go play golf, I'll bring along. A lot of times I'll bring Kirk Bauermeister along because he's a good golfer and people are impressed. And when they learn he's a follower of Jesus, oh, well, that just makes it even better. You mean, how can you play golf and not swear? Kirk's a good example of that. You know why they call it golf, right? Because all the other four-letter words are used up. But the point is, people, when we, when we evangelism is a team sport, and so whatever you do, as you're going out, just don't go out by yourself. Bring along somebody from Palm Harvest to be a part of your team. So with whom is Jesus inviting you to team up with? That's what we see here in these verses. So friends, we need each other. I know that I need you. And so this week, with God's help, let's go out. This week, with God's help, let's invite in. With God's help, let's share the load together as we strive to be God's hands and feet. Amen? All right, let's close in prayer. Hands open. Heart open. Mind open. Pray this in your heart. Heavenly Father, today as I go out... Use me to be a person who brings positivity into my circles. Let my smile speak the words that are in my heart. Let my presence communicate the message that I'm with you and that you're not alone. And I'm for you. Lord, help us to go out this week. And help us to invite in this week. There are people in our world who who are desperately looking for an invitation to join us. Help us to know when we use our social media presence what to share that maybe can bring a word of encouragement to someone who's following us. Lord, use us. Continue, Father, I pray to help us as a church to be a church of people. A church is not a building, it's people. Help us to be a people who sees the value in others. 
Jesus, you were someone who were, was criticized because you hung out with the riffraff. I want to be a guy who hangs out with the riffraff. I want to be a guy, Lord, who hangs out with those who others have given up on. So use us today. And lastly, I just want to say for those of you who are feeling like you could need a touch of Jesus on your heart today. Maybe you don't feel very lovable. Maybe you're feeling discouraged. Just know that God is with you right now. Let me just pray for you. Lord, I pray for those who are here today who are in that place. They're feeling broken. They're feeling despair. They're feeling like they're not sure how they can move forward. Would you just touch them today? Would you pick them up today? And would you remind them today that you want them to be on your team? So Lord, we love you. We praise you for the story. Jesus, for the way you brought Mary and Joanna and Susanna. So many others to join you. We too want to join you. So use us this week, we ask in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Church, thank you for being a part of my ministry. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to go away to the desert for a couple of days to invest in pastors who just need a little hope. And so I want to do that for you too. If you feel like I can be your golfing buddy, right? If I can be a part of your life and your strategy, please let me know because that's I'm here to serve as well. I know who I belong to. There's no hiding from you because I know my heart is what. I know my heart is what you seek, and so I will not falter. I'm running to the altar, and I'll offer to you all of me. We thank you, God, once again for who you are. We thank you for what you've done people like us, people that don't deserve it, but because of your love and your grace, you've decided to give it to us anyways, and that's the good news, so we thank you, in your name we play, amen. Palm Harvest, you have a wonderful Sunday.